a nonprofit news outlet serving Texans around state politics and policy. And I think there were a handful of things I wanted to do at the 19th that made us being a for-profit um, a non-starter for me. And the first was, I want all of our journalism to be entirely free to consume. Your ability to pay for news should not be the barometer that determines whether or not you can access it. So free to consume, free to republish. I want every other news organization in the country to be able to freely republish our work uh, across their platforms. So the woman on the bus in El Paso going from job one to job two picks up a copy of the El Paso Times and sees our stories. That's also the best way, by the way, to get men to read our work, which is equally important. And then the third piece was I wanted to offer the kinds of benefits and flexibility that were virtually unheard of in our industry. So those were things like six months of fully paid family leave for all new parents, um, four months of fully paid caregiver leave. So you could spend the last four months of your mom or dad's life by your bedside, by their bedside. Um, you know, the kinds of salaries that allow women to get ahead, to take time off when they need to, to make sure that they come out the other end and are still on that escalator to success. Um, now, none of us expected there would be a pandemic. Uh, like, I never thought I would be, was going to be launching the 19th in the midst of this environment. Um, I am coming to you today, like, uh, unshowered and just with red lipstick on because my child is quarantined right now. Her daycare shut down uh, for two weeks because there are confirmed cases of COVID in her classroom. I am like barely hanging on by a thread today. And this is the story of a lot of moms in our, in uh, not just nationally, but in this newsroom that we've launched, you know, trying to build a brand new platform when basically every mom on your staff suddenly needs to take family leave. It's been um, a totally wild ride. Um, all this to say, thank God we chose the business model that we did. Well, I think that count me in for wanting to work for you with <laughs> those types of benefits. Those are not the norm and your red lipstick looks fantastic. Uh, thank you. Hopefully the rest of me is just hanging on. You're, you're doing great. Um, you have put together quite a team of journalists and I assume you're not all meeting in the newsroom like you would have in the past. How is it leading a new business and a new concept with staff across the country? Unreal. Unreal is the only way to put it. I mean, I know a lot of people are experiencing this right now, but we've launched a staff where I have not met 80% of my team in person. I mean, everything we do is just like this. Um, we have, you know, we have multiple staff meetings a day that are done by Zoom. We have our story planning meetings by Zoom. We have staff happy hour on Wednesday by Zoom where you don't get to talk about work at all. all you know, we have icebreaker conversations, sort of ways to try to keep, you know, um, uh, morale up and make sure that people get to know each other and build the kind of camaraderie and inside jokes that are kind of nice to have in a workplace. But it's, I mean, it's been surreal, you know, to have, we used to cover presidential debates and we would all be in the room together with a giant pizza and, you know, um, you know, looking over each other's shoulders, trying to work through the copy, make sure the lead to the lead, which is the top of the story is what we thought it should be, make sure the right photography had been uh, selected. It is so complicated. I think we don't give ourselves enough credit for how tough it is to have this additional layer of technology between us with everything that we do. Um, now, at the same time, I'm, uh, I'm all about silver linings because that's the only way we're going to get through this moment. Um, the silver linings are we have a team of people all over the country. They can stay wherever they have the best child care, wherever they have the best elder care situation. Uh, it's also great for the regional diversification of what the 19th is trying to build. So we have journalists in Des Moines, in New Orleans, in Philadelphia, in Orlando, in Los Angeles. Um, you know, I think this moment in history has made us all so comfortable comfortable and confident with the fact that we can do this work from wherever we are. Uh, and I think in many ways, long term, will give women the kind of flexibility in the workplace they are not used to having, which is, you know, oh, I want to be a mom. Like, I, I don't have to be sitting in the editing chair in the office from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. with a commute on either side. You know, that's just it. it we give each other so much more of the benefit of the doubt right now. Um, and I hope that's something that sticks with us, you know, well beyond this pandemic, assuming we're ever out of it. Well, I think we can also have conversations like this and include many more people who wouldn't have had the opportunity to join otherwise because they are at home or they're behind a desk and they can't get away or, or whatever that is. So totally. I 100% agree. Yeah.
I mean, to that point, we planned a big, what we thought was going to be a big launch summit for the 19th. We we ha- were going to have it in a, a Philadelphia museum. It was going to be beautiful. We thought maybe we'd have 500 women in the room with a couple of big name speakers. And then, of course, we had to take everything virtual. And when we took this summit virtual, suddenly I could ask anyone. And suddenly anyone, you know, all these wild names that were pie in the sky started saying yes, whether it was Melinda Gates or Hillary Clinton or Kamala Harris or then Megan. Markle. I mean, by the time our launch summit was all said and done, we had not a thousand people in the room. We had 190,000 people watching in real time. And and I'm going to, I'll give Meghan Markle credit. Like I'd guess 90,000 of those people were there for her. The other hundred thousand, I think, you know, were people who got to be engaged in this programming because it wasn't in a room in Philadelphia because it was virtual. And so I do think again, you know, more, more silver linings, more turning lemons into lemonade, um, but there's something there. Well, very well done. Um, As you know, economic security and leadership are the two main focus areas of the Texas Women's Foundation. These are certainly primary um, areas for the 19th news as well. You launched in the middle of the COVID shutdown, which we've already talked about, and have published many articles on the impacts of COVID on women's economic security and work life. Is there an article that really surprised or alarmed you about women's lives? Gosh, I mean, every article right now is alarming me about women's lives, but I think, I mean, I think, so the first, I'll I'll talk about a a pair of stories that go together. One of the first really big stories we wrote was about the she session, about the fact that, you know, effectively women's career opportunity, career growth has been set back by a decade Um, and and how scary that is for so many women who uh, ended up making the choice in this moment to leave the workforce, um, to be home with their children, either because they had no other alternative or because their husband maintained his employment. Um, You know, I think we are looking at an extraordinary time where effectively a generation of women are being forced out of work uh, who who wouldn't have made that choice otherwise. And I think we need to be really honest with ourselves about what that means. but then we had a story last month that looked at, you know, how women continue to leave the workforce. Things have not actually stabilized. And you're seeing job losses of, you know, 800,000 job losses for women compared to, to 150 or 200,000 job losses for men with women of color, with black and Latino women being hit absolute hardest. Um, and, and so I think this isn't just, to me, this isn't just a general generational setback. Like this is, you know, we're gonna have to come back swinging in the aftermath of this pandemic to even make up a fraction of the difference. And so I think I just feel um, I feel very disheartened when we look at, at the reality and what that has meant for families, what that has meant for, um, for women's economic opportunity, for their earning power. Uh, and, and this is certainly a much bigger risk for, again, not just women of color, but, uh, but single moms, um, people who are trying to navigate this, this moment without enormous fin- uh, either financial or familial support. You know, when you think about family caregiving. We had a story a few weeks ago about how many, uh, you know, when when COVID disproportionately hits uh, the elderly who are Black and Latino, uh, who are the people caring for those elderly Black and Latino people? It's their kids. And, and their kids are coming into those that orbit. And, you know, it's this, this, there's a trickle down effect. The family caregiving aspect of this is enormous and it's really painful. Um, and I think, again, the repercussions there, the long-term repercussions there for, for job loss, for economic damage, and for familial health is going to be, and mental health, my God, let's not even start. I mean, that piece of it, um, it's just, it's just immense. And sorry to be all doom and gloom, but this is a really, really scary and really sad time. No, you're absolutely right. Um, Dina Jackson, who is the expert, quite frankly, behind the research that we've just concluded, um, she can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was 40% of Texas the state of Texas households are run by single single family moms. It's run by single moms. Yeah, uh, and I just can't look. I can hardly keep the wheels on, and I have help. You know, I have a husband who who carries his his load, and I just cannot even imagine. Yeah, I am right there with you. Um, so we're gonna switch gears a minute. Everybody, hold on to their seat. Mm-hmm. Nonpartisan reporting on politics is part of your business plan. And here in Texas, we have begun early voting for the November 3rd election. This election cycle is history making in many ways between Kamala Harris on the Democratic ticket and vice president to record to record numbers of Republican women running for office across the country. 
and I just lost the rest of my question. Where did it go? Mm -hmm. Um, oh, there we go. What should we all be paying attention to as the U as, as the US in the home stretch of this election cycle? Sure. So the first thing I would say is, is a cautionary tale of keep your powder dry and don't expect that we're going to have election results on election night. Uh, I mean, I think we all need to get comfortable with the idea that doing this safely and accurately uh, with the number of mail-in ballots that there are, you know, this could take weeks. And I think we all have to, first of all, get very, you know, I saw a great New York Times story uh, yesterday about how they believe election security is tighter and tougher than it's ever been. How many states uh, in the aftermath of the 2016 election were doing really great work to sort of lock down their systems. And so there's great optimism in, in the accuracy. There is also an expectation that this is not going to happen overnight and that we need to sort of settle in for the long haul here. So that's the first thing I'd say. Um, the second thing I'd say is, you know, voter turnout is through the roof. And look, we have yet to, to determine whether um, it's that people don't want to vote in the regular, in the general election. So they're getting out ahead and voting early because they don't want to have to vote on election day. They're worried that they, their vote might not get counted if they're waiting in ridiculous lines. So, you know, but I think what we do know is that there's enormous enthusiasm to get out and to vote and to vote early. Um, and I think that's, um, that is, is really sort of a fascinating development as we look at engagement, not just in Texas, but around the country. Um, yes, there are more conservative women running. There are more women running. I mean, we, we keep having every year, it's like a record year for women candidates. Um, and, and this year is obviously no exception, um, you know, on both sides of the aisle. I think it's gonna be really, um, really interesting to see whether all this early voting enthusiasm translates into you know, Biden-Harris enthusiasm and what that necessarily means for, for down ballot races. Um, I'm having a lot of conversations. The great thing about being in Texas is that, and you know, I spent most of my career covering the Texas legislature, one of the most conservative st state legislatures in the country in, in Austin, Texas, you know, one of the most progressive cities in the country. And I think um, I learned a lot and, and became very close with a lot of folks on both sides of the aisle. And I'm hearing from a lot of Republicans right now who are casting their ballots for Biden. Everybody else on their ticket is a, Repu is a Republican. Um, a lot of them are saying really interestingly, this has been a fascinating development for me to see, uh, they feel more comfortable voting for Biden this time around because they believe they have a lock on the Supreme Court. And for a lot of women, for example, who you know are um, anti-abortion, for whom that's sort of their most the, the most enduring reason that they vote for Republicans uh, over and over again, they actually are feeling comfortable voting for Biden because of uh, Amy Coney Barrett's nomination to the Supreme Court, which is a, a pretty fascinating. I mean, I'm talking to Republicans who've literally never cast a ballot for a Democrat before and are preparing to do it or have already done it. Wow, that is fascinating. It is. The whole thing is fascinating. I mean, if, you know, like, yes, the future of our nation is at stake. And also it's fascinating. <laughs> we have a few minutes before we need to turn this over to Dina uh, for qu questions that are probably in our chat. Um, and I just have one more question for you before I turn it back over to Dina. And that is when we're seeing women on both sides of the aisle running, what do you think that means for the future of our country? What, what have we, what can we tie in from other parts of the world, perhaps when it comes to women in, in leadership positions, we're fighting so hard, it seems to have women stay in the workforce. And so, especially in a situation like this, what does it mean for women to have women in elected office? It means that they see role models. It means that they see opportunity, that they can do this themselves. I mean, the more women we see running and winning, the more other women believe that this is something that they can do and that they can accomplish. I mean, look, it's even fascinating to have Amy Coney Barrett, you know, she's got seven kids. Like talk about the ultimate working mom, you know, to, to see women, regardless of their politics, ascending to the highest levels of politics and policy, I think is really affirming for young women who are hopefully following in their footsteps. Um, I also think it has policy implications. Look, like we know, or I, I mean, look, use the Texas legislature as an example, uh, women in elective office overwhelmingly author the education that advances equity, uh, advances equity for women, advances educational opportunity, advances healthcare systems. Um, I think, you know, those tend to be areas where women are most deeply engaged. Um, they're also really pretty good at working across the aisle. That's the other thing that, you know, almost without fail in my years covering the Texas legislature, a really great bipartisan piece of legislation was authored by two women 
women across the aisle working together. There was always a women's caucus, uh, you know, that included women from both both sides of the aisle. So. I think women tend to be, on average, uh, better at listening, better at communicating, better at, at considering with empathy what drives people to vote the way they vote uh, and to feel the way that they feel. Um, and I think, you know, um, uh, oh, last thing I'll say is if you look at all the countries that really got their COVID rates under control pretty quick, over and over again, those countries are run by women. So it could be a coincidence. It also could be that we need more women in elective office. Well, Emily, this has been an excellent conversation. I, it has been my honor to chat with you. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you for what you're doing for Texas and for women across the nation. My, um, pleasure. my pleasure, this is so much fun for me. So thanks, I hope there's some great questions. Dina, I'll turn it over. Okay, thank you so much, Susan. I really appreciate you um, going through this conversation with Emily. Um, I'm actually personally a subscriber of the 19th News, and they are now a part of my breakfast right next to a couple of other newspapers. And so um, this is super exciting for me to get to visit with you as well. Thank you, Dina. So we've just got through talking about um, the upcoming election, which will be on November 3rd. And we'll just keep saying that for all of you. If you have not voted, you need to go vote. You need to make a plan. Get out there and vote. Um, that night, so the night of the election, kind of how do you divide up your, your team, so to speak? I mean, are, are certain of your journalists going to be listening to something? And then you are an online written publication. So what kind of, what's the night going to look like? What kind of deadlines do you all want to hit internally? Right. Okay. So great questions. The first is how, how we sort of decide where we are. So we have key journalists in swing states. So, um, you know, they're in places around the country where we think there will be enormous interest, whether that's Pennsylvania, whether that's Florida. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not ready to say that I think Texas will be a swing state, but it's possible. We've got journalists in Texas too. Um, and, and so, but, but COVID has thrown a crazy wrench into all of this. You know, it used to be that we would all be out at polling places or we'd be with candidates or we'd be you know, now your conversations around doing that, it's, it's in many ways, it's irresponsible to put your journalists into these environments without the right, you know, protective equipment. So, and we'll probably have a reporter in Delaware, you know, where, where uh, in Biden's territory, we'll probably have a, we certainly have reporters in DC, but it will certainly, it will be a divide and conquer approach. Again, the other thing is on normal election nights, we know the results, right? So you have a couple different versions of the stories pre-written, not in your systems, you know, in a safe place where you can be more ready to go and pulling in feeds as the night goes on. Um, we, and I know a lot of national news organizations, again, are preparing for the reality that like, unless it's a landslide, um, we probably won't have results on election night. And so what does that look like? How is the storytelling different? You know, a lot of news organizations have been used to running a, a whole bunch of visuals on election night, charts and updating maps. Well, what does that look like necessarily if you only have a quarter of your results in potentially? Um, so we're still grappling with what the storytelling looks like. We at the 19th are really trying to focus on women voters, um, you know, versus trying to make sure, and, and, and we're gonna be focusing on the races where there are key women in play, uh, women candidates in play, um, versus like the sort of breathlessness of every single, you know, every single race, whether the Senate or the House are gonna flip, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, that's interesting, yeah, because I'm focused on um, on a few specific elections, but yeah, thinking about that there, there's, like you said, the focus on women across the state or across the country that yep. are running that we really want to pay attention to. Yep. And so in order to get this hot and ready for the 19th news on Wednesday morning, what time do your staff need to get their articles in? Oh my gosh. I mean, the, the problem with a digital news site is that it's 24 seven, right? So we'll have people probably working in shifts all night long. Um, you know, at the same time, you also have to make sure you don't burn people out. We don't have a very big staff. And if this is an election season versus an election night, uh, we'll definitely have to stagger it and have some pretty good shifts. But yes, I mean, I imagine we'll be writing stories that start posting at, you know, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock that night and are just sort of updated through the night and through the morning as we get more clarity and information. Okay, thank you. So now we've got, I want to bring in a question right now from one of our viewers tonight. So it says, why are conservative women in politics often the ones we highlight or attack? I applaud Judge Amy Coney Barrett and her hard work, but women are judged not by their merit as much as they are judged by, quote, everything else. You mentioned her as an, the ultimate working mom. 
Could we not support women whether we agree with their politics or religion? I think that's a great question. And I think that's an important question. I think, I mean, I always start to sound the alarm when I see women attacking women, regardless of their political persuasion. You know, I think we honestly have a responsibility to hold women up and, and make sure that we're allowing them to set that, that example of what, you know, of what being engaged in politics and policy means. It is, you know, I think it's perfectly acceptable to take issue with someone's politics. It's perfectly acceptable to take issue with their policies and their track record and the way that they've voted or the way that they've legislated or litigated. I think when you see people, you know, I saw people who I know on Facebook who started to put pictures of Amy Coney Barrett with the, you know, um, oh gosh, what's that TV show? The, um, uh, the Handmaid's Tale, you know, mm -hmm. putting her in the sort of head, head skirt, headdress, stuff like that, which to me is just gross, right? Like that's, you know, that's not what this is about. If you want to take issue, again, with someone's politics or policy, like go right ahead. But I don't think I, certainly any of us, but particularly women should be stooping to the level of those, of those kinds of attacks. Thank you. I, I agree completely. We do, and we do, even though right now, if there's a lot more Democratic women running for office than Republican, and that's kind of been historical, but there are some organizations that are specifically focused on increasing the number of Republican women that are, um, that are getting in line to get into office. And so yep. there's a lot of work. And I think it's important to note, note that women uh, voters and women candidates are not monolithic, even within their own parties. I mean, I think, look, you know, all, I'm assuming the overwhelming majority of you in the audience live in Texas. Well, I mean, I know women in Texas who are staunchly anti-abortion and also staunchly anti the death penalty. And they look at our two party system and they say, well, where exactly do I fit here? I think, you know, it, it's important to note that, that you can't pigeonhole women um, based on their uh, political orientation. Um, and I think, honestly, we should create some bigger tents. We should create more opportunity for women to decide uh, where they stand and how they vote uh, that isn't, you know, deeply tied necessarily to a party structure. Thank you. So um, moving away from the election for just a moment, this is kind of something I thought about as you were talking earlier. Your degree is in journalism, right? And so, and you've spent your life as a journalist and as an editor. And now you've got a really different role. Granted, you, you are running a journalism organization, but you are the CEO. What was it like making that switch from a journalism brain to a CEO, business, HR, finance, <laughs> fundraiser, everything that you've had to do this past year? Yes, I mean, uh, it's a, a seismic shift. It's interesting, you know, I've gone through a couple of big seismic shifts. And the first is a, a pretty common one, and that's going from reporter to editor. And that is a pretty seismic shift because you're used to it. There's a lot of ego involved in being a reporter. You're so used to seeing your name, you know, your byline on the stories, to be out pounding the pavement. You know, being a reporter is a really exciting and really fun job. And then you become an editor, and suddenly you're making other people's work shine, but it isn't your name and your brand. And, and that was an evolution one that became sort of almost maternal for me, where suddenly I realized it also coincided with me having a baby when suddenly you shift and it shifts from being all about you to like, what can I do to support and to bring along these people who are working for me or who are, uh, who I'm raising. Um, and then the CEO shift happened this year. And it's hard for me to separate the CEO shift from the pandemic for me because they happened at once. Um, and I'm responsible for, uh, you know, not just the finances, but in many ways, the livelihoods of close to 30 people who have left their jobs to come work for the 19th. So it's really scary. Um, you know, I'm the fundraiser in chief for sure, which has strange, it's unusual, an unusual parallel to being a reporter, where as a reporter, you got fearless about asking anybody anything. And that has really paid off in fundraising, candidly, um, because I sort of have no shame. You know, I, I can go to people and say, you know, what I really need is $100,000 or what I really need is $250,000. Can you do that? And a lot of times people say no. Most of the time people say no. Um, but at least I wasn't afraid to ask. And so it's been interesting. I kind of think that gutsiness that comes with being a reporter has served me well in this new capacity as a CEO. Um, I also think, honestly, that being a mom has has helped me in this capacity, not just the sort of common multitasking that everybody talks about, but like at the end of the day, she's the only thing that matters to me. And I am going to do my damnedest to make this work and make her proud. Um, but at the end of the day, if I work this hard and I don't succeed, I still have her and she's perfect and she's all I really need. And so I think that's given me a little bit of the 
I'm not, I'm not afraid of failure the way that I used to be. And that's very liberating um, when you're doing something risky. <laughs> I imagine. Well, and, and I think you come to that feeling, honestly, I can share with everybody. I had the joy of standing in line with your father a couple of years ago, <laughs> we were waiting to hear a speaker and it was incredibly hot. And I think your mother was hiding under a shade tree somewhere. And anyway, I was visiting with him, noticed his badge and asked if he knew you. And of course he was like, oh yes, that's my daughter. He is so incredibly excruciatingly proud of you and the work you do. And so I can certainly hear you sharing that about your own daughter as well. Yeah, well, it's been super fun, uh, you know, to have my parents in the mix here too. But also, I think for many of you, probably, you know, trying to navigate this pandemic with small kids and, you know, and parents who you need to basically keep safe, protect from this virus at all costs is just one other thing on top of starting a uh, launching a startup. So, I'm sure, many of you are in the same boat. So, nonprofit journalism is kind of new, I guess, maybe the last, fifth, well, of course, we've had NPR forever. Um, and then there's a lot of hybrid models, like what we're seeing here in Dallas, the Dallas Morning News is a traditional news source. And they've recently launched a nonprofit arm called the Education Lab. And we're seeing that as well in Pennsylvania and in Seattle and other places. But for young journalists that are coming on board and either want to go study journalism or maybe getting out of school, it's a very different world than it used to be. Kind of what advice do you have or ideas with regards to the changing journalism landscape? What should they be ready for? What should they be looking at? Sure. Look, I mean, we're not out of the woods from the standpoint of we uh, this this um, this economic environment has only exacerbated the sort of downfall of regional newspapers, local newspapers around the country. There was a really frightening New York Times story this weekend about how uh, in the absence of community newspapers, which have closed, independent newspapers closing right and left, there are partisan publications that are trying to fill the gap. They're largely propaganda machines. Um, you know, they are, they have names like the Gazette and the Daily News, but really they are, um, I think in this case, these were largely, you know, conservative publications, uh, you know, either funded by political action committees or, um, largely political in nature that we're trying to sort of emulate or pretend that they were, um, you know, independent news organizations. And I think that's, um, so there's a lot of risk in this industry right now. I do think the sort of shining star or the bright light right now is how many um, nonprofit news organizations you're seeing crop up across the country. You know, there are something like 70 to 80 different nonprofit local newsrooms in the vein of the Texas Tribune that have cropped up in the last 10 years. You're seeing specialty nonprofit news organizations, not just like the 19th, but also uh, like the Marshall Project, which focuses on criminal justice. Obviously, I'm sure many of you are aware of ProPublica, which is the you know, national hallmark for investigative reporting. Um, there, the list goes on and on, and there are a lot of other exciting publications in the works. And so I feel really enthused um, by that. I do think it's important to find business models where you're not just dependent on philanthropy. To me, um, you know, a sort of a sustainable model requires a whole lot of diversified revenue. Um, but I also think it's very, I'm very optimistic, very hopeful that we're seeing a lot of different brands um, cropping up to sort of fill that gap. Well, thank you for mentioning that article from the New York Times. And if anybody's interested, I can actually, um, we'll make sure we include that article in the follow-up email, because one of the things that also talked about was changes in our federal law since the beginning of the 1900s that's really changed ownership of media outsource of media sources both print as well as online and um, that was a fascinating look at things that I had not uh, not really thought about. So somebody wants to ask a question about one of my favorite Texans, which is Molly Ivins. And so Molly Ivins noted that Texas politics are essentially nationally national politics. And we do hear a lot, right, that as Texas goes, so goes the nation. Yep. Um, Ms. Ivins explained that this was because Texas is expansive and includes so many facets of the United States within its borders. You making the move from Texas to national, would you agree that Texas politics is kind of a harbinger for what we see on the future national level? 100%. I mean, I, I would say that if you hadn't said it, I feel uh, even more confident. So I've, you know, I've, I, I'm from DC originally, where people think that they are the center of the universe. And then I moved to Texas, where people also think that they are the center of the universe. And I will tell you, Texas is the center of the universe. It's the reason that I've been here for 18 years is the reason we started a new national publication from Texas. 
the reason I procreated in Texas. Um, you know, I believe very deeply that, that as goes Texas, as goes the nation. And I think whether you look, whether it's the, the sort of politics and the purpling of Texas, whether it's our textbooks that get exported all over the country, you know, whether it's the sort of economic influence of Texas, whether it's the demographic shifts in Texas, the immigration conversations in Texas. I mean, I think Texas, I, I would call it a microcosm of the country, except there's nothing micro about Texas. So it's a it's a macro microcosm of the United States for sure. Um, I got to I got to moderate a conversation after a screening of the Molly Ivins documentary um, last year pre-COVID, and it was just such a wonderful film. If you haven't seen it, I absolutely recommend it. But yes, I mean, Texas, I had a reporter, a Texas reporter call me today because they had a job offer in another state, a reporting job offer. And they said, I'm just afraid that if I, that nothing's ever going to be as sexy as Texas politics, that Texas is changing so fast and it's such a fascinating place. And that if I go to this other state and I cover politics, like the wind is going to get taken out of my sails. And I sort of couldn't argue with that assessment. You know, Texas is on the national radar, on the national map in such a huge way. Um, I never thought I would stay in Texas, to be honest. I, my parents were both political journalists in Washington, D.C. I thought I would come sort of start my career at the Dallas Morning News. And then, of course, I would go back and work, you know, hopefully work my way up to work at the Washington Post or the New York Times. And I got to Texas and I realized it was the most exciting place that I could possibly be at this moment in history. Um, it stood that stood the test of time for me. And I think candidly, one of the reasons the 19th has been successful in this short amount of time is because we chose to launch it in Texas. Um, I just think there's been proving the case that you can build a national venture uh, out of out of the heart of the United States is um, has been a really big selling point for us. No, well, you know, it was it I don't remember if it was Stephen F. Austin or if it was Houston that said, uh, uh, that you all can go to hell and I'm going to go to Texas. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, that's how I feel too. I've okay. recruited my whole family. They all live here now. They've all moved here from DC and LA. So yeah, we're part of that growing Texas problem. Absolutely. absolutely. So um, in the video earlier about the 19th Society, one of the things we saw was that you do, um, you're not just an online print publication, but you do programs um, like the launch that you had with all the great speakers. We saw one go by with um, Senator Kay Bailey Hutchinson. And I know from your reporting that childcare education has been a huge issue in your reporting. And you've got one coming up actually on public education um, during a pandemic. Tell us a little bit about what you're looking to do with that program. Sure. So as, as you noted, we had this big program this summer, the summit, that was a huge, I mean, such a wild success that we decided to extend this programming into the fall to see if it was a one-off or if there would be interest that was this deep. And we decided to go deep on a particular topic, so child care and public education in the pandemic. Um, and the good news is the summit wasn't a one-off. Elizabeth Warren said yes to part participating right away. This is all on Wednesday, by the way. You can sign up on our website. 19thnews.org. It's all free. It's just an afternoon of programming. So Elizabeth Warren, uh, Margaret Spellings, who you all know, I'm sure, a former Secretary of Education under George W., um, you know, incredible panels of educators from around the country, almost all of them um, women of color, uh, including some tribal education leaders. I mean, when you think about the challenges of educating in this pandemic, We've got rural lawmakers, we've got tribal or rural teachers, tribal teachers, we've got urban, big urban, um, you know, superintendents and principals. And then we have some really sort of special programming mixed into it. So Natalie Portman is reading her brand new uh, children's book, which is a retelling of fables from a feminist perspective, which we should all appreciate will be super cool. Um, you know, the Youth Orchestra of Los Angeles is performing via Zoom with this, the Grammy winner, um, singer songwriter Brandi Carlisle, which is just like a magical, I got to see an early version of it and it's just magical. Um, so there's, the, the, I didn't know that the programming would work, honestly, I mean, we're all here together on Zoom. Um, I didn't know that this would be a, a convening point when people couldn't convene in the flesh like they can at the Texas Tribune Festival. Uh, but I think for the moment, this is the way that people want to engage. And as I think Susan said earlier, you know, it gives them the flexibility to participate in their pajama pants or, you know, with their a nursing baby on their lap. And that's really special too. Now that sounds really exciting. And the actual program is this Wednesday. This Wednesday. Yep. One starting at one o'clock central time on Wednesday. Oh, excellent. Okay. Thank you so much. That's, I'm, I'm actually wrote down Natalie Portman's children's book. I need to go <laughs> yes. I yeah. dig that up for some friends. I know it's sweet. 
And so I guess the last thing before we close out, because I want to respect you and your time and, and your daughter. Um, <laughs> My husband is with her right now. So let's just make this last as long as, as you long as he gets, <laughs> you can just say they just kept me, sweetie. I, know, I couldn't, couldn't break away. away. Yeah, that's right. Um, we've, you talked a lot about the importance uh, for women that, that we need to get to where we're going and make sure that we have that hand behind us to bring up the women behind us. As we're looking at policy and politics at all levels, the local up to the national, what are a couple of things that you think we should be doing as, as individuals and as citizens to advocate for women? Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, I think, look, I'm, we cover politics and policy, so I'm not going to get in the business of um, telling you how you should vote or on particular things, but I do think uh, looking seriously at our family leave policies in the United States and um, doing a little homework on the kinds of policies that other countries offer as de facto and that we in the United States have to fight for and pay for tooth and nail or don't get at all. I do think I've been um, pretty, it, it's been stunning to me as I was building those policies for the 19th, what what I mean, there are a lot of news organizations in this country that offer offer exactly zero paid family leave. Uh, I'm, that's stunning to me in this day and age, especially given how hard this is. Um, so I think a lot about family leave. I think a lot about health care policy. Um, and I think a lot about about um, how we lift women up, how we give them the flexibility. I mean, it's, you know, there are lawsuits going on in states over whether uh, you can use your campaign finance dollars to pay for childcare. You know, like what, what better campaign expense could there possibly be than having a babysitter while you're, you know, knocking where you're when you're while you're block walking. Um, I think about a lot of policies. Um, I think about policies, equity based policies, like, you know, why most states still t put taxes on tampons, right? Like, if you read our website, you're going to find a whole bunch of stories that are going to make your jaw drop and because you just never thought about it that way. And I think there's a lot of there's a lot of design bias that is that we have just sort of taken for granted as women for generations and generations that needs to be turned on its head. And I think that starts with women getting better educated, better informed, and then hopefully more deeply engaged in their democracy. You know, what I always tell the listeners that I talk to when I do the research stuff is there's a lot going on. So pick a couple of things that really speak to you because we can't act on all of it. We can't be experts on all of it, but pick a couple, learn about it. And then that's where you can really put your efforts. Don't, don't get overwhelmed with, with so much. Right. I mean, it's interesting. We, we polled our 19th readers, 97% of our readers report having taken one civic action, at least one civic action in the last year, but a civic action can be, you know, it can be signing a petition outside of your grocery store. It can be going to a city council meeting. Like you don't have to do everything. I mean, I think that's that's right. You know, like find the one thing or a couple of things that really matter to you and make those your, you know, your personal projects. Um, I think it's really worthy for us to get more deeply engaged if for no other reason than to prove to the women coming behind us that this is, um, it's par for the course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's kind of what we do. And it's kind of what we think as well. And Texas is one of the states that still, um, charges the tampon tax. And I can tell everybody that there was a bill that came up in 2019 to overrule that and it did not pass. So I'm pretty sure that we'll be seeing that come through again this time as well. So that yeah. is one of them. And Dina, I just want to say thank you also for the work that you all do. I, you all are just such an institution and have meant so much to so many women. So I'm, I'm deeply appreciative and I hope your full audience knows exactly how meaningful you are to, to your community and to Texas writ large. Thank you so much, Emily. We'll back right back at you. Okay, everyone. Then I think we're going to say goodbye to Emily, and I'm going to get ready to say goodbye to all of you. Um, Emily, Susan, it has been a real delight. Um, I appreciate you talking to us about why a news outlet focused on gender and policy and those intersections really helps us bring it all out. Um, that's a gender lens, and that's kind of what the Texas Women's Foundation is all about in our work. Um, I want to thank everybody that joined us today and because it is truly your attention and your focus that helps us to create a Texas for all. And before we go, though, I want to ask everybody to make three commitments. All right. First of all, I would love for you to go to our website, www.txwf4all.org to find out how you can educate, activate, and advocate, and then also donate to support the issues that we discussed today. 
In there, you're going to see the opportunity to join the 19th Society, who's our great hosts today. And Susan Long is actually the chair of that committee, as well as joining our Army of Advocates. And the Army of Advocates is the special group of Texas Women's Foundation supporters that are working from an advocacy standpoint. You'll receive a monthly newsletter that gives you not only the details on a very specific policy issue, but will tell you exactly who do you need to call? How do you call that person? Who's your representative? If you haven't voted, voted. Go put that on your calendar. And then, of course, um, last but not least, I really want you to check out the 19th News. They're going to help you analyze these issues. They're going to help you discover new ones and uh, allow you to raise your voice in an even more powerful way. So on behalf of the Texas Women's Foundation, Emily, the 19th. We appreciate you all being with us today. Take care. Thank you.